Well, it's good to be back with you all after my summer travels. Missed seeing you. I've missed opening my Bible and thinking about what I'm going to preach about on a Sunday. Writing sermons is completely delightful and utterly painful. <clears throat> Not just for you. Because it requires opening up the Bible and digging into it, and the Bible is the book of life, which means it's utterly delightful and sometimes a little painful. It's a handbook for what it means to be human, and so in there, of course, we're naturally going to find tension. It's also the most influential book that has ever been written, not because it gives answers or imparts information, but because it unveils and it transforms through discernment. It encourages us to go to those places, whatever places we find in the Bible, whatever those stories provoke in us, pull apart the tension. It's worth reading. So this summer while I was in London, uh, I met up with one of our younger parishioners who's studying at the London School of Economics, and he came to all of the services uh, that the Epiphany Choir, some of you are back today, welcome back, The Epiphany Choir was singing at, and between two of those services on Sunday, he and I went out for lunch at a great Indian restaurant. And I wish I could remember the name of it. I'd recommend it. It was fabulous. But, uh, and we talked theology, and the Bible came up. And he said to me, when he's with his friends from Garfield, and they ask him about his faith, what he thinks about it, he says he always responds this way. He says to them, if someone told you that they had just read a book that more people have read than any other book in the entire world, and that this book has had more of an impact on the world than any other book ever written, somebody told you that, wouldn't you go and pick up that book and read it. He said, that book's the Bible, and whether you believe it or not, the fact that it has such an enormous impact should, at the very least, make you curious about reading it. Wouldn't you say? He went on to say that he uses the same argument about Jesus. He says when they ask him about his relationship with Jesus, he says, well, if there was one person who lived, who had more impact on more people than any other person that ever lived, wouldn't you want to learn something about him? Our focus at Epiphany is knowing about this guy, Jesus, and opening the Bible and reading it. It's what makes us a learning church. So today, the learning we're going to focus on comes from the Apostle Paul, from the letter to the Romans. And we're going to talk about faith And we're going to talk about discerning our faith. But to get to faith, today we're going to pass through mercy. Lex talked about mercy last Sunday. You may remember the quote, we could all use a little mercy. Well, the good news is mercy abides. If you are here today and you see one another here, mercy is present in your life. Because mercy... There's many things, but it's about God keeping us around. Mercy is about God loving us, not because of what we do, but because simply we are souls that are set in the world. So to understand mercy as a concept begins with acknowledging that God is God, and that God is good, and that God is big, and that God is capable, and that God made all things, and that God gave us freedom, and that God put us here with purpose and intention right here, right now, to be in God's creation. And then God looks at our lives and shakes God's head and keeps us around anyway. That's mercy, right? God loves us more than our own actions account for. That's mercy. Not measured by worth, but measured by God's love. You with me on mercy? A little bit, and amen? All right. Because now we're moving straight into faith. 
Because faith is our response to this mercy. Faith is taking a mirror and holding it up and looking in that mirror and seeing ourselves and saying, because I see me, God is merciful. God wants me around. Faith is trusting God. Faith is trusting that God, that God's got this. Faith is saying that irrespective of what I see surrounding me in that mirror as I look upon myself, whatever's in the background, whatever my context, God's got this. The measure of our faith, the strength of our faith is proportionate to our capacity to say, God's got this, irrespective of the circumstances we find ourselves in. Now, that's not always easy. We see the fires in Maui, and we wonder. We hear about the war in Ukraine, and we wonder. We have an accident, or we see a loved one go through something difficult, or maybe pass away, and we wonder. Tragedy hits, and we wonder, does God really have this? I had an experience like that this summer. I was fishing. And I know, I know you, you expected me to talk about fishing because I just got back from vacation. And you're probably expecting to hear me say, I caught this really, really big fish. And I did so while I was walking on water, blindfolded. And I'll tell that story another time. <laughs> but not this time. This time, I was fishing with some buddies on a river they knew well. They had fished there a lot over the years, and they had literally caught hundreds of fish out of that river. But that wasn't the case this year, and it's not just because they were with me, I don't think. But because the environmental circumstances changed, something was imposed upon that particular river that caused an ecological imbalance within the fish community something that was initiated by politicians who classified one particular type of fish that had wandered up the river as an endangered species that ate another kind of fish that lived there that was native to that space, and extermination happened slowly, 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 and then quickly. And I was there to witness that tipping point. And I wondered, does God have this? Right, is this that I witness part of God's plan? Is God happy? Is God sad? Is God going to do something about this? And then discernment creeped in. Because like you, I go to a learning church. And it caused me to wonder, why am I part of this story? Why am I here? What's my role? That's the question to ask when we experience a tension that rises up around this question of faith. Does God have this? And when the does God have this sound in our minds more like, I wonder if God has this, then we're being invited to something. Wherever we find ourselves in the situation, whenever we're wondering the question, does God have this? Know that in the question, when it comes up, you are being invited into a conversation with God. Know that you're being invited to discern within that particular tension, whatever tension you found yourself in. The tension that causes you to wonder, does God have this? And when you find yourself in that place, know this. You've been invited by God into a place of discernment. Because discernment is a conversation with God about the context of your life. It's discernment. And it has three components. Probably has a lot of components. But it has three components that I want to talk about today. The first component of discernment is gratitude. That sounds funny. But it, it's gratitude for God's mercy. The, the mercy of God that allowed us to be in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in in the first place. Now, this isn't gratitude for the tension necessarily. It's certainly not gratitude for the ecological disaster that may be being witnessed or whatever you're witnessing. 
but gratitude that God has trusted you to be in the conversation, to be in the tension. Thank you to a merciful God. Now, gratitude is practiced when we participate in the spiritual exercise of worship. The name we give it tells the story, Eucharist. What does Eucharist mean? Wow, wow. thank you, right? It's, Eucharist is thank you. This is a spiritual exercise of gratitude. And this is where we begin our discernment, week in and week out with this practice. But next we get down to business. As people formed by a learning church, we open our Bible, we take a look at Jesus, we study. In the Bible, we find these tensions that run up against the tension that we're experiencing in our own life. I can guarantee you'll find it someplace in the Bible. And then in these stories, we look for parallels. We feel things that are calling us up and out of ourselves. We look at the tensions we find there, and we think about the tensions we find in our own lives. And then we study Jesus. And we seek to understand his life. And we look for there's over, and there are, we look for overlapping folds that exist between Jesus' life, as we know it taught in Holy Scripture and the Gospels, with our own life. And where those folds overlap is revelation. It's revelation of our capacity to have the power to face whatever circumstance we are facing. Jesus gives us that power. So we study Jesus and we study the Bible to gain insight into our capacity to do the will of God in whatever circumstance that we find ourselves in. Study the Bible, we look for the tension, and we follow Jesus to look for the overlapping opportunities for impact. So we have gratitude for the mercy of God, we gain insights by studying the Bible and Jesus. And then we turn to our community, right? To people who read the Bible, people who study Jesus, people who will listen when we ask the question in their presence, why am I in this story? Why did God set me in this particular situation? Which then, of course, leads to more questions, doesn't it? Am I here to witness something? Am I here to learn something? Am I here to be prepared for some future event that I'm going to find myself in? Am I supposed to get involved right here and right now in this crisis? Because these questions are where the rubber hits the road. Do I do something? Do I not do something? Do I do something at some future point in time? These are the discernment questions towards outcome. And they are all equally legitimate, the yes, the no, the not yet. That's the discernment process when we find ourselves in this tension, where we're wondering if God indeed has this. It's discernment that begins with gratitude, that moves to study, studying the tensions in the Bible, studying Jesus. And finally, reflecting with our community on these questions, why am, in, I, why am I in this story? And what am I supposed to do? The faithful life is the discerned life, which leads to the good life. And the good life is not without tension. The good life is a life that is of well-trained, perpetual, ongoing discernment. And that's what Paul's talking about today in this letter. And I'll finish here. I quote, be not conformed to this world, but transformed by it through the renewing of our minds, through the discernment of our context, so that you may know the will of God, which is good and acceptable and perfect. The faithful life is the good life. The faithful life is the acceptable life. The faithful life is the perfect life. Is it without tensions? No. Is it without doubt? No. It is a life wondering 
Is it a life wondering, does God have it? The answer is yes, because it is a life in conversation with a merciful God, a loving God, a present God, who keeps us around to be in conversation with God's creation. And the more we discern, the more certain we become that, yes, God does indeed have this, and we are here, invited by God, the merciful God, to be part of the conversation, the yes, the no, or the not yet.